Chapter two and three of Looking Backward. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Anna Simon. Looking Backward, two thousand to eighteen hundred and eighty seven by Edward Bellamy. Chapter two. The thirtieth day of May, eighteen eighty seven, fell on a Monday. It was one of the annual holidays of the nation in the latter third of the nineteenth century, being set apart under the name of Decoration Day, for doing honor to the memory of the soldiers of the North who took part in the war for the preservation of the Union of the States. The survivors of the war, escorted by military and civic processions and bands of music, were wont on this occasion to visit the cemeteries and lay wreaths of flowers upon the graves of their dead comrades, the ceremony being a very solemn and touching one. The eldest brother of Edith Bartlett had fallen in the war, and on Decoration Day the family was in the habit of making a visit to Mount Auburn, where he lay. I had asked permission to make one of the party, and, on our return to the city at nightfall, remained to dine with the family of my betrothed. In the drawing-room, after dinner, I picked up an evening paper and read of a fresh strike in the building trades, which would probably still further delay the completion of my unlucky house. I remember distinctly how exasperated I was at this, and the objurgations, as forcible as the presence of the ladies permitted, which I lavished upon workmen in general, and these strikers in particular. I had abundant sympathy from those about me, and the remarks made in the desultory conversation which followed upon the unprincipled conduct of the labour agitators were calculated to make those gentlemen's ears tingle. It was agreed that affairs were going from bad to worse, very fast, and that there was no telling what we should come to soon. The worst of it, I remember Mrs. Bartlett's saying, is that the working classes all over the world seem to be going crazy at once. In Europe, it is far worse even than here. I am sure I should not dare to live there at all. I asked Mr. Bartlett the other day where we should emigrate to if all the terrible things took place which those socialists threaten. He said he did not know any place now where society could be called stable, except Greenland, Patagonia, and the Chinese Empire. Those Chinamen knew what they were about, somebody added, when they refused to let in our Western civilization. They knew what it would lead to better than we did, they saw it was nothing but dynamite in disguise. After this, I remember drawing Edith apart and trying to persuade her that it would be better to be married at once without waiting for the completion of the house, spending the time in travel till our home was ready for us. She was remarkably handsome that evening, the morning costume that she wore in recognition of the day setting off to great advantage the purity of her complexion. I can see her even now, with my mind's eye, just as she looked that night. When I took my leave, she followed me into the hall, and I kissed her good-bye as usual. There was no circumstance out of the common to distinguish this parting from previous occasions when we'd bade each other good-bye for a night or a day. There was absolutely no premonition in my mind, or I am sure in hers, that this was more than an ordinary separation. Ah, well. The hour at which I left my betrothed was a rather early one for a lover, but the fact was no reflection on my devotion. I was a confirmed sufferer from insomnia, and although otherwise perfectly well, had been completely fagged out that day from having slept scarcely at all the two previous nights. Edith knew this, and had insisted on sending me home by nine o'clock, with strict orders to go to bed at once. The house in which I lived had been occupied by three generations of the family of which I was the only living representative in the direct line. It was a large, ancient wooden mansion, very elegant in an old-fashioned way within, but situated in a quarter that had long since become undesirable for residents, from its invasion by tenement houses and manufactories. It was not a house to which I could think of bringing a bride, much less so dainty a one as Edith Bartlett. I had advertised it for sale, and meanwhile merely used it for sleeping purposes, dining at my club. One servant, a faithful coloured man by the name of Sawyer, lived with me and attended to my few wants. One feature of the house I expected to miss greatly when I should leave it, and this was the sleeping chamber which I had built under the foundations. I could not have slept in the city at all, with its never-ceasing nightly noises, if I had been obliged to use an upstairs chamber. But to this subterranean room no murmur from the upper world ever penetrated. When I had entered it and closed the door, I was surrounded by the silence of the tomb. In order to prevent the dampness of the subsoil from penetrating the chamber, the walls had been laid in hydraulic cement and were very thick, and the floor was likewise protected. 
in order that the room might serve also as a vault equally proof against violence and flames for the storage of valuables, I had roofed it with stone slabs hermetically sealed, and the outer door was of iron with a thick coating of asbestos. A small pipe, communicating with a windmill on the top of the house, ensured the renewal of air. It might seem that the tenant of such a chamber ought to be able to command slumber, but it was rare that I slept well, even there, two nights in succession. So accustomed was I to wakefulness that I minded little the loss of one night's rest. A second night, however, spent in my reading chair instead of my bed, tired me out, and I never allowed myself to go longer than that without slumber from fear of nervous disorder. From this statement it will be inferred that I had at my command some artificial means for inducing sleep in the last resort, and so in fact I had. If, after two sleepless nights, I found myself on the approach of a third without sensations of drowsiness, I called in Dr. Pillsbury. He was a doctor by courtesy only, what was called in those days an irregular or quack doctor. He called himself a professor of animal magnetism. I had come across him in the course of some amateur investigations into the phenomena of animal magnetism. I don't think he knew anything about medicine, but he was certainly a remarkable mesmerist. It was for the purpose of being put to sleep by his manipulations that I used to send for him when I found a third night of sleeplessness impending. Let my nervous excitement or mental preoccupation be however great, Dr. Pillsbury never failed, after a short time, to leave me in a deep slumber, which continued till I was aroused by a reversal of the mesmerizing process. The process for awakening the sleeper was much simpler than that for putting him to sleep, and for convenience I had made Dr. Pillsbury teach Sawyer how to do it. My faithful servant alone knew for what purpose Dr. Pillsbury visited me, or that he did so at all. Of course, when Edith became my wife, I should have to tell her my secrets. I had not hitherto told her this, because there was unquestionably a slight risk in the mesmeric sleep, and I knew she would set her face against my practice. The risk, of course, was that it might become too profound and pass into a trance beyond the mesmerizer's power to break, ending in death. Repeated experiments had fully convinced me that the risk was next to nothing if reasonable precautions were exercised, and of this I hoped, though doubtingly, to convince Edith. I went directly home after leaving her, and at once sent Sawyer to fetch Dr. Pillsbury. Meanwhile I sought my subterranean sleeping chamber, and, exchanging my costume for a comfortable dressing-gown, sat down to read the letters by the evening mail which Sawyer had laid on my reading-table. One of them was from the builder of my new house, and confirmed what I had inferred from the newspaper item. The new strikes, he said, had postponed indefinitely the completion of the contract, as neither masters nor workmen would concede the point at issue without a long struggle. Caligula wished that the Roman people had but one neck that he might cut it off, and as I read this letter I am afraid that for a moment I was capable of wishing the same thing concerning the labouring classes of America. The return of Sawyer with the doctor interrupted my gloomy meditations. It appeared that he had with difficulty been able to secure his services, as he was preparing to leave the city that very night. The doctor explained that since he had seen me last, he had learned of a fine professional opening in a distant city, and decided to take prompt advantage of it. On my asking, in some panic, what I was to do for someone to put me to sleep, he gave me the names of several mesmerizers in Boston who, he averred, had quite as great powers as he. Somewhat relieved on this point, I instructed Sawyer to rouse me at nine o'clock next morning, and, lying down on the bed in my dressing-gown, assumed a comfortable attitude, and surrendered myself to the manipulations of the mesmerizer. Owing, perhaps, to my unusually nervous state, I was slower than common in losing consciousness, but, at length, a delicious drowsiness stole over me. Chapter 3 He is going to open his eyes. He'd better see but one of us at first. Promise me, then, that you will not tell him. The first voice was a man's, the second a woman's, and both spoke in whispers. I will see how he seems, replied the man. No, no, promise me, persisted the other. Let her have her way, whispered a third voice, also a woman. Well, well, I promise, then answered the man. Quick, go! He's coming out of it. There was a rustle of garments, and I opened my eyes. 
a fine-looking man of perhaps sixty, was bending over me, an expression of much benevolence mingled with great curiosity upon his features. He was an utter stranger. I raised myself on an elbow and looked around. The room was empty. I certainly had never been in it before, or one furnished like it. I looked back at my companion. He smiled. "'How do you feel?' he inquired. "'Where am I?' I demanded. "'You are in my house,' was the reply. "'How came I here?' "'We will talk about that when you are stronger. Meanwhile, I beg you will feel no anxiety. You are among friends, and in good hands. How do you feel?' "'A bit queerly,' I replied. "'But I am well, I suppose. Will you tell me how I came to be indebted to your hospitality? What has happened to me? How came I here? It was in my own house that I went to sleep.' "'There will be time enough for explanations later,' my unknown host replied with a reassuring smile. "'It will be better to avoid agitating talk until you are a little more yourself. Will you oblige me by taking a couple of swallows of this mixture? It will do you good. I am a physician.' I repelled the glass with my hand and sat up on the couch, although with an effort, for my head was strangely light. "'I insist upon knowing at once where I am and what you have been doing with me,' I said. "'My dear sir,' responded my companion, "'let me beg that you will not agitate yourself. I would rather you did not insist upon explanations so soon, but if you do, I will try to satisfy you, provided you will first take this draught, which will strengthen you somewhat.' I thereupon drank what he offered me. Then he said, "'It is not so simple a matter as you evidently suppose to tell how you came here. You can tell me quite as much on that point as I can tell you. You have just been roused from a deep sleep, or, more properly, trance. So much I can tell you. You say you were in your own house when you fell into that sleep. May I ask you when that was?' "'When?' I replied. "'When? Why, last evening, of course, at about ten o'clock.' I left my man Sawyer orders to call me at nine o'clock. What has become of Sawyer? I can't precisely tell you that, replied my companion, regarding me with a curious expression. But I am sure that he is excusable for not being here. And now, can you tell me a little more explicitly when it was that you fell into that sleep? The date, I mean. Why, last night, of course. I said so, didn't I? That is, unless I've overslept an entire day. "'Great heavens! That cannot be possible! And yet I have an odd sensation of having slept a long time. It was Decoration Day that I went to sleep.' "'Decoration Day?' "'Yes, Monday, the 30th.' "'Pardon me, the 30th of what?' "'Why, of this month, of course, unless I have slept into June, but that can't be. "'This month is September.' "'September?' You don't mean that I've slept since May. God in heaven! Why, it's incredible! We shall see, replied my companion. You say that it was May 30th when you went to sleep? Yes. May I ask of what year? I stared blankly at him, incapable of speech, for some moments. Of what year? I feebly echoed at last. Yes, of what year, if you please. After you have told me that, I shall be able to tell you how long you have slept. It was the year 1887, I said. My companion insisted that I should take another draught from the glass and felt my pulse. My dear sir, he said, your manner indicates that you are a man of culture, which I am aware was by no means the matter of course in your day it now is. No doubt, then, you have yourself made the observation that nothing in this world can be truly said to be more wonderful than anything else. The causes of all phenomena are equally adequate, and the results equally matters of course. That you should be startled by what I shall tell you is to be expected, but I am confident that you will not permit it to affect your equanimity unduly. Your appearance is that of a young man of barely thirty, and your bodily condition seems not greatly different from that of one just roused from a somewhat too long and profound sleep. And yet, this is the tenth day of September, in the year 2000, and you have slept exactly 113 years, three months, and eleven days. Feeling partially dazed, 
I drank a cup of some sort of broth at my companion's suggestion, and, immediately afterward, becoming very drowsy, went off into a deep sleep. When I awoke, it was broad daylight in the room, which had been lighted artificially when I was awake before. My mysterious host was sitting near. He was not looking at me when I opened my eyes, and I had a good opportunity to study him and meditate upon my extraordinary situation before he observed that I was awake. My giddiness was all gone, and my mind perfectly clear. The story that I had been asleep one hundred and thirteen years, which, in my former weak and bewildered condition, I had accepted without question, recurred to me now only to be rejected as a preposterous attempt at an imposture, the motive of which it was impossible remotely to surmise. Something extraordinary had certainly happened to account for my waking up in this strange house with this unknown companion, but my fancy was utterly impotent to suggest more than the wildest guess as to what that something might have been. Could it be that I was the victim of some sort of conspiracy? It looked so, certainly, and yet, if human lineaments ever gave true evidence, it was certain that this man by my side, with a face so refined and ingenious, was no party to any scheme of crime or outrage. Then it occurred to me to question if I might not be the butt of some elaborate practical joke on the part of friends who had somehow learned the secret of my underground chamber and taken this means of impressing me with the peril of mesmeric experiments. There were great difficulties in the way of this theory. Sawyer would never have betrayed me, nor had I any friends at all likely to undertake such an enterprise. Nevertheless, the supposition that I was the victim of a practical joke seemed on the whole the only one tenable. Half expecting to catch a glimpse of some familiar face grinning from behind a chair or curtain, I looked carefully about the room. When my eyes next rested on my companion, he was looking at me. "'You've had a fine nap of twelve hours,' he said briskly, "'and I can see that it has done you good. You look much better. Your colour is good, and your eyes are bright. How do you feel?' "'I never felt better,' I said, sitting up. "'You remember your first waking, no doubt,' he pursued, "'and your surprise when I told you how long you had been asleep. "'You said, I believe, that I had slept one hundred and thirteen years.' "'Exactly.' "'You will admit,' I said, with an ironical smile, "'that the story was rather an improbable one.' "'Extraordinary, I admit,' he responded. "'But, given the proper conditions,' not improbable nor inconsistent with what we know of the trance state when complete as in your case the vital functions are absolutely suspended and there is no waste of the tissues no limit can be set to the possible duration of a trance when the external conditions protect the body from physical injury this trance of yours is indeed the longest of which there is any positive record but there is no known reason wherefore had you not been discovered and had the chamber in which we found you continued intact, you might not have remained in a state of suspended animation till, at the end of indefinite ages, the gradual refrigeration of the earth had destroyed the bodily tissues and set the spirit free. I had to admit that, if I were indeed the victim of a practical joke, its authors had chosen an admirable agent for carrying out their imposition. The impressive and even eloquent manner of this man would have lent dignity to an argument that the moon was made of cheese. The smile with which I had regarded him as he advanced his trance hypothesis did not appear to confuse him in the slightest degree. Perhaps, I said, you will go on and favour me with some particulars as to the circumstances under which you discovered this chamber of which you speak and its contents. I enjoy good fiction. In this case, was the grave reply, no fiction could be so strange as the truth. You must know that these many years I have been cherishing the idea of building a laboratory in the large garden beside this house, for the purpose of chemical experiments for which I have a taste. Last Thursday the excavation for the cellar was at last begun. It was completed by that night, and Friday the masons would have come. Thursday night we had a tremendous deluge of rain, and Friday morning I found my cellar a frog-pond and the walls quite washed down. My daughter, who had come out to view the disaster with me, called my attention to a corner of masonry laid bare by the crumbling away of one of the walls. I cleared a little earth from it, and, finding that it seemed part of a large mass, determined to investigate it. The workman I sent for unearthed an oblong vault some eight feet below the surface, and set in the corner of what had evidently been the foundation walls of an ancient house. 
a layer of ashes and charcoal on the top of the vault showed that the house above had perished by fire. The vault itself was perfectly intact, the cement being as good as when first applied. It had a door, but this we could not force, and found entrance by removing one of the flagstones which formed the roof. The air which came up was stagnant but pure, dry and not cold. Descending with a lantern, I found myself in an apartment fitted up as a bedroom in the style of the nineteenth century. On the bed lay a young man. That he was dead, and must have been dead a century, was of course to be taken for granted, but the extraordinary state of preservation of the body struck me and the medical colleagues whom I had summoned with amazement. That the art of such embalming as this had ever been known we should not have believed, yet here seemed conclusive testimony that our immediate ancestors had possessed it. My medical colleagues, whose curiosity was highly excited, were at once for undertaking experiments to test the nature of the process employed, but I withheld them. My motive in so doing, at least the only motive I now need speak of, was the recollection of something I once had read about the extent to which your contemporaries had cultivated the subject of animal magnetism. It had occurred to me, as just conceivable, that you might be in a trance, and that the secret of your bodily integrity after so long a time was not the craft of an embalmer, but life. So extremely fanciful did this idea seem, even to me, that I did not risk the ridicule of my fellow physicians by mentioning it, but gave some other reason for postponing their experiments. No sooner, however, had they left me than I set on foot a systematic attempt at resuscitation, of which you know the result. Had its theme been yet more incredible, the circumstantiality of this narrative, as well as the impressive manner and personality of the narrator, might have staggered a listener, and I had begun to feel very strangely when, as he closed, I chanced to catch a glimpse of my reflection in a mirror hanging on the wall of the room. I rose and went up to it. The face I saw was the face to a hair and a line, and not a day older than the one I had looked at as I tied my cravat before going to Edith that decoration day which, as this man would have me believe, was celebrated one hundred and thirteen years before. At this, the colossal character of the fraud which was being attempted on me came over me afresh. Indignation mastered my mind as I realized the outrageous liberty that had been taken. "'You are probably surprised,' said my companion, "'to see that, although you are a century older than when you lay down to sleep in that underground chamber, your appearance is unchanged.' That should not amaze you. It is by virtue of the total arrest of the vital functions that you have survived this great period of time. If your body could have undergone any change during your chance, it would long ago have suffered dissolution. Sir, I replied, turning to him, what your motive can be in reciting to me with a serious face this remarkable farrago, I am utterly unable to guess, but you are surely yourself too intelligent to suppose that anybody but an imbecile could be deceived by it. Spare me any more of this elaborate nonsense, and once for all tell me whether you refuse to give me an intelligible account of where I am and how I came here. If so, I shall proceed to ascertain my whereabouts for myself, whoever may hinder. You do not then believe that this is the year two thousand? Do you really think it necessary to ask me that? I returned. Very well, replied my extraordinary host. Since I cannot convince you, you shall convince yourself. Are you strong enough to follow me upstairs? I am as strong as I ever was, I replied angrily, as I may have to prove if this jest is carried much farther. I beg, sir, was my companion's response, that you will not allow yourself to be too fully persuaded that you are the victim of a trick, lest the reaction, when you are convinced of the truth of my statements, should be too great. The tone of concern, mingled with commiseration, with which he said this, and the entire absence of any sign of resentment at my hot words, strangely daunted me, and I followed him from the room with an extraordinary mixture of emotions. He led the way up two flights of stairs, and then up a shorter one, which landed us upon a belvedere on the house-top. "'Be pleased to look around you,' he said, as we reached the platform, "'and tell me if this is the Boston of the nineteenth century.' At my feet lay a great city, miles of broad streets shaded by trees and lined with fine buildings, for the most part not in continuous blocks, but set in larger or smaller enclosures, stretched in every direction. 
every quarter contained large open squares filled with trees, among which statues glistened and fountains flashed in the late afternoon sun. Public buildings of a colossal size and an architectural grandeur, unparalleled in my day, raised their stately piles on every side. Surely I had never seen this city, nor one comparable to it, before. Raising my eyes at last towards the horizon, I looked westward. That blue ribbon winding away to the sunset, was it not the sinuous Charles? I looked east. Boston Harbour stretched before me, within its headlands, not one of its green islets missing. I knew then that I had been told the truth concerning the prodigious thing which had befallen me. End of chapter 3